Hi all. Another great game I thought checking out games on my iPad in front of the TV was uh, David Navarra against Henrik Danielsson. Now Navarra 2736 uh, had just mashed up Essamon in, in round 9. Henrik Dan Danielsson, some of you might know, had a fantastic YouTube channel and he was covering systems like the polar bear, what he calls the polar bear F4 with white. He was playing black here but a very innovative in the openings, actually a very, very interesting player. And I like also, he had a lot of philosophical videos, uh, creating an analogies with nature about um, how, you know, as a, as a farmer, you, you make use of <laughs> the manure. It's like making use of your losses. All, all the stuff is good, like compost for, for, for evolution, your own evolution and learning. Uh, like uh, you, you'll be a good farmer, you know, you try and make use of everything. And, um, he ha was having a fantastic tournament here. Uh, and let's see what happened in this game. E4 from David Navarra. And we have quite an unusual opening in the Philidor. So D6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3 is actually the most common move. Then we have this quick E5. So black doesn't mind the exchange of queens. That's a bit reminiscent, you know, if white took and we have the exchange of queens, it's a bit reminiscent of the Berlin defense. No, white doesn't want that because uh, you can see that black will later be playing things like c6 maybe and the king coming to c7 without too much of a problem. White plays the most popular move, knight f3. We have this, bishop c4, very popular stuff, well trodden. a4 here, actually players are often castling as well, it doesn't really matter, it transposes. c6. So is this a really good system to play against someone over 2700? Is it a bit passive? This bishop in particular, is it a little passive? Rook e1. It could have occurred recently, um, something similar, uh, when it, in the c4 like variation of the Karakhan in my recent over the ball games, I was running this kind of setup. It's kind of a quilled spring. Uh, black now, usually plays b6 statistically but uh, the tension in the center was released maybe this is a little bit double-edged it's a bit rarer but still over 100 games with this e takes d4 knight takes d4 and immediately you know knight f5 looks like an issue that's covered hitting the bishop with tempo bishop drops back we have rookie eight now white plays h3 so it looks as though f4 might be pleasant in the future black plays a5. The knight could though just drop back to g6, it seems, without too much of a problem. Bishop e3, bishop f8. So at least there'll be frontal pressure on e4. So in black, releasing the tension, he's got some pressure on the e file. Queen d2. The knight goes to g6. So encouraging white, this slight weakening move f3. You know, I think not, not a big deal. Uh, this f3 is, is there a butterfly effect in chess though a tiny little move like that weakening some dark squares and all of a sudden look at that diagonal it's a bit weaker than usual these squares in general are a bit weaker than usual how can you possibly imagine the butterfly effects from from playing f3 could there be a problem later well interestingly black plays a move which uh, given the limited scope of this bishop, maybe not too surprising, bishop e6 challenging white's dangerous attacking piece. But white takes on e6, and it looks as though, well, there's no there's no counterpart. Couldn't white have great pressure now on the light squares? And this next move seems entirely logical to, you know, try and maximize the pressure on the diagonal. Why not play f4 here? Black gets out of the way because of the imminent f5. Now possibly... Uh, maybe white could build up a little bit more here, uh, consider building up a little bit more. But he went for things with f5. He's slightly weakening the dark squares a bit with this. It isn't all uh, positive. There's some downsides here. E takes, e takes. The knight returns to e5 now, a very comfortable central square. But it's immediately challenged with bishop d4. It's reinforced or not. Nope, pardon me. This would be the reinforcement move, which was rejected. Uh, so maybe this this is actually more interesting, just to move it out of the way. Because, and the reason actually, is perhaps black wants to blunt 
the a2 bishop with d5 so he doesn't want to leave that target there he wants to play, be able to play d5 which would also not just blunt this bishop but liberate this one uh, it will be able to use these squares like d6 c5 and b4 so we have an exchange of rooks now with queen uh, being kicked now with rook e1 it goes to h5 Bishop e6, so it seems, yeah, is white dominating the position? He's got the bishop into black's position before d5 happened. Is d5 a little too late? It's played anyway because it still liberates the bishop. And we have now the move queen e3, which looks pleasant enough. All the pieces are protecting each other. Queen h4 now, which does stare at the rook. And is that a big deal? Maybe White didn't think so. He probably thought he had a quite a dominating position. Look at these bishops looking at White's king. Couldn't he just crush Black with g4, g5? That's a bit tempting, isn't it? Let's see. g4 was played. But there's a rude awakening here with this g4 move. Can you spot what Black does in this position? A very resourceful, neat little tactical move. The prelude to a great orchestra of tactics actually. So black to play here, if I give you five seconds, what would you play in this position? And like the previous game I've showed you actually, there's, there's something to do with rooks being looked at, which is quite decisive amusingly, as a spectator amusingly, not, not for the players playing it or on the receiving end. So what would black do here to kind of emphasize the loose, slightly loose rook, it's only protected by one piece. So you can consider these kind of nearly loose pieces or, you know, can be encouraged to be loose somehow, but Black's got a resource based on that. Five seconds, what would you play? Okay, Bishop c5, yes. So Bishop takes d4 is now threatened with Queen takes. So say, you know, Bishop takes, Knight takes, so the Queen can't leave protection of e1. And actually d4 is threatened, so if Rook d1, you know, Black's very comfortable here after b6. He's got rid of the two bishops from white. The bishop's not doing that much here and black's got a good grip, grip on the position. Uh, maybe even knight e4 later if something like g5. So yes, now white sensibly took the rook out of the firing line here but we enter the realm of tactical brutality here. What does black play in this position? If I give you five seconds starting from now. Okay, knight takes g4, ouch, hitting the queen. If h takes, queen takes g4 check is pretty nasty because double attack on the king and, and the bishop. If rook g2, queen takes d4 is sufficient. Okay, so that can't be taken. Oh dear. What has happened here? Is white still going for black's king? He tries f6. Another really brutal move in this position is played, in fact, after this f6. Uh, aesthetically uh, interesting to look at. What would you play here? Okay, there are actually two very good moves. It turns out in this position, bishop takes d4 is is very good here because we'd be protecting g7 there. So fg would just take. If queen takes, we enter with queen g3, white's position, and it's a disaster. You know, like rook g2 is an immediate mate. If the king moves, then we just mop up here this position. I mean, this is good enough. But uh, even more spectacular looking in this position. Uh, black played queen takes f6, making use of the pin against the e3 queen. I thought, wow, this has really sprung to life for black. I thought, I'm <laughs> just checking this game out. So bishop takes f6 was played, and black just keep, simply keeps the, the pin on the queen with knight g takes f6, protecting this knight, which would still keep the pin on the queen if that was taken. Bishop takes, knight takes, black's just pawns up. He's just got a winning position here against David Navarra. A 2 7 3 6. Okay, it might not have been Navarra's greatest um, 
game this one but it just shows that they're just human even if they're over 2700 seemingly with a bishop pair and seemingly you know just tempted for this g4 move and he finds his himself in a very bad position now he's just pawns down the game continued for a bit but um yeah it's not too much counterplay here another pawn's been mopped up here why well, it's trying to create a dangerous pass pawn potentially taking on b7 but um it's not such a problem it's really not a big deal he's just material down lots of material down and after knight d3 resigns um so yes a bit brutal this Reykjavik open there there are some very very interesting games which you don't really get in the Grandmaster All Players, the Super Grandmaster All Players. You get real brutality of tactics coming to the fore, as as you see in these two games this morning, which I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube, and well done to Henrik Danielson for taking down one of the top guns of the tournament, the the number four seed of the tournament. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.